Welcome to John Fallon's Indie Film NYC podcast, where we help filmmakers merge the art and business of independent filmmaking. I'm your host, John Fallon. Welcome to episode 12 of John Fallon's Indie Film NYC podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Writer Duet, the new standard for screenwriting. Writer Duet is gaining popularity because it is the most flexible and nimble screenwriting software out there. Because Writer Duet is primarily online, you no longer have to wait months or even years for new features because Writer Duet continually tweaks and adds to the writer's needs seamlessly. Writer Duet can also import scripts written in most of the major software choices available. It is also able to export FDX files, which allows you to work with professional breakdown and budgeting software used by professionals throughout the industry without any need for reformatting or conforming. And Writer Duet's best function for indie filmmakers is the ability to collaborate on scripts in real time and track changes with infinite revision history simply by signing into your web browser and adding a collaborator by email. Writer Duet is the most modern screenwriting software and is becoming popular on a worldwide level. If you would like to try Writer Duet, I am including an affiliate link in the show notes. Simply sign up through that link and you'll be able to give it a test run absolutely free for as long as you'd like. You'll be able to immediately collaborate and create industry standard professional quality screenplays. Then, if you decide you need the extra features of the pro version, it's a simple upgrade and also gives a small part of the purchase back to Indie Film NYC. That money helps us grow the site's features and bring you more valuable content. So try Writer Duet today. So today I'm speaking with Jenna Edwards of Jenna Edwards Media. Jenna Edwards is an award-winning producer and produced the first narrative feature for Hulu. Jenna is on a mission to shift the independent film scene so that it is a thriving, viable option for artists and filmmakers and to saturate the film industry with meaningful, creative, or fantastical films created by passion. I first became aware of Jenna Edwards a few months ago when I heard her on the Indie Film Academy podcast with Jason Buff. The story of her path to producing is interesting and definitely not the typical story one hears. I encourage you to listen to Jason's conversation with Jenna as well as the episode of Film Trooper where Jenna Edwards talks to Scott McMahon about how she overcame PTSD from a horrific event and used that experience to produce films that matter to her. I'll leave links to both episodes as well as some others in the show notes. You can find those on IndieFilmNYC.com forward slash IFNYC012. Jenna's positive attitude towards filmmaking and life in general and her focus are infectious. She truly believes in the power of film to impact people's lives in meaningful ways, and she has stories to back that up. Being that her backstory was pretty well covered, I wanted to talk to Jenna about the practical application of her knowledge where it applies to you indie filmmakers out there who are looking to either produce your own work or find a producer to work with you. Jenna has a lot of experience with the relationships between indie filmmakers and producers and gives you a peek into that world. We covered so many things in this hour that it's almost an entire course in film producing. If you're unsure at all about the role of a producer, you've got to listen to this conversation. We also delve into what's behind Jenna Edwards Media and Indie Movie Mastery, the businesses that Jenna formed with the main purpose being to help filmmakers not only get their films made, but to make a living while doing so. She has some great products and tools for you to use, and you can also hire her directly as a consulting producer. Definitely take a look at her website and check out what she has to offer. So now I present to you my conversation with Jenna Edwards. You may want to grab a pen and paper and take some notes. Here we are with uh, Jenna Edwards today of uh, Jen Jenna Edwards Media and uh, Indie Movie Mastery. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks. Good. How are you? I'm great. Um, I'm really happy to talk to you. Uh, you know, uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, talk to you about, since I think, uh, you know, on some of these other podcasts, we've, we've really covered kind of kind of your backstory and, uh, you know, where you came from, like, personally, and uh, mm -hmm. some of your personal journeys and struggles, uh, which maybe we'll touch on. But the first thing I want to really talk about is maybe, like, the uh, the work that you've done that that you feel maybe gave you kind of your base of like yep. authority. So, so not necessarily like your first film, but like, you know, what's your body of work? Tell, tell me a little bit about how that's brought you where you are. Okay. Um, I mean, April showers is absolutely my base cause I didn't go to film school. And so I consider that my film school. 
Um, fortunately and unfortunately at the same time, it was, it was a very high pressured film school. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a project that we all kind of got together to make because we were all passionate about the subject matter. It was written and directed by a survivor of Columbine. And, um, it was his story of the actual shooting and the five days that followed, um, which was really important to me because so many people make movies about the event, but they don't actually show what happens to the survivors afterwards. And so we were, we thought we were going to make a nice little movie. And then all of a sudden the industry, like certain people in the industry started to find out and it became bigger than we had anticipated. And, um, so we were really unprepared for that. And at the same time, really prepared because each of us individually had already kind of mastered our area of what we were doing. And um, so that's definitely where I get a lot of my references from because we had made the common mistakes that most filmmakers make of thinking, you know, getting into a film festival like Sundance is a distribution model, which it absolutely is not. And, um, (laughs) you know, like really learning how to take charge of not only the shooting and making of the film process, but the, uh, the overall producing process meaning where's the film going to go? Like, what kind of equipment are you going to shoot on? How are you going to get your cast? How are you going to get your funding? What are you going to do once everything comes together in the different phases? And so um, I'm a big believer in working backwards. And after that experience, I had the ability to work backwards because it prompted, in a very different way, I think, than most people do, because it prompted... um, the film method podcast where we got to interview over a hundred different filmmakers in different areas of the industry. And every time I interviewed anybody or talked to any filmmaker, I was always comparing so that I could do better the next time. Um, and so my area of expertise is really in strictly producing And what I mean by that is figuring out how to create, how to keep the creative integrity, but bring in the business aspects so that everybody on the project wins Mm -hmm. essentially. Um, And then I went on to teach producing at New York film Academy where I got to, you know, hone the, the different process. It's so funny. I learned film school from teaching film school. Does that make sense? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, but it was, it was fascinating to me because I never, I came out to LA to be an actor. Mm-hmm. And so I, I only had an idea of the business because my parents were in a rock band. I grew up with my parents, like really making a living doing music. Mm-hmm. And so I understood a lot of the business aspects because of that. And they fascinated me. And so that's what I think made me a different kind of independent film producer. Um, And like all of this stuff was before social media is or was what it is today. And so there wasn't all of this incredible interaction and ability to share. And so it was it was. It was just a different world Mm -hmm. then. And so I was able to really come in and be be able to learn producing that way. Sorry. So, I'm yes. sorry, around what year was that? So when was April showers and, and when so were you we teaching? So decided to do April showers in 2007, okay. um, raised the money, went and shot it in 2008 and we released it in 2009. Okay. And then, so, and then following year you started? The, uh, the following year we, I actually, um, my, two producing partners and I produced the first narrative feature for Hulu. Um, and we did that as a, an experiment in distribution to kind of see what the new um, distribution models could handle financially. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was pretty fun. Like we get, and now I get to say I was the first producer to make a move for Hulu, which is, you know, cool. Um, and then I went into teaching at New York Film Academy. And so how was, how was that experiment? Like what, what, what'd you learn from that? Well, I mean, this was back in 2010, so it's different now, but Hulu actually was one of the outlets that paid the most from our first feature release. Mm -hmm. Um, we, 
because we decided that film festivals was going to be a distribution model, um, we ended up they, we ended up not getting into them because the market crashed and Sundance, for example, was taking more lighthearted and comedic mm -hmm. type movies and ours was absolutely not that. Like, it is not the feel-good movie of the year. <laughs> and so we were like, what are we going to do with this? Like, we, we got all of these investors involved and they were, you know, equity investors that weren't, they weren't film investors. And so we really cared about getting them their money back um, and so with April showers, we ended up doing what was called a day and date release. And we were one of the very first to ever do it. And that was releasing in the theaters and on iTunes at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, and so because we had that experience and we were able to, um, kind of dive into digital distribution in a way that most filmmakers hadn't at that time, we decided to do a film specifically for digital release um, and that's how Hulu got involved and Hulu was actually awesome to work with. They were one of the best paying as far as, you know, online distribution is concerned. I don't know their model now. Um, cause this was way before Hulu is what it is today. Sure. Like they weren't doing original content right. at that time. Um, but it was a great experience. Absolutely. I, I would say though, micro budget is probably as an indie filmmaker, the way to go with Hulu. Mm -hmm. um, but Hulu's just one aspect of digital distribution now. So if you come together and you bring all the different outlets in and you're intelligent about how you're going to distribute your film, mm -hmm. I think you have a really good shot at making your money back. But again, you have to really think about it from the, from the beginning, like what you're going to do at the end with it. And is, it, is that something that you feel like you know, you should be doing, like, are you, like, if, I, if I've got a film, let's just say, yeah. you know, a feature, should I be looking at putting it out in, in many different ways at the same time? Yes, I think so. Um, here's how I look at it. If you're going to go out and raise equity financing mm -hmm. um, and get investors to invest in your project, you have to look at it like a business. So how are you going to make their money back? Granted, most businesses, you know, they always say most businesses fail within two years. Um, filmmaking is no different in that sense, where the investor isn't going to be like, well, you said you were going to make this money back for me. Um, just like they're going to want to see that you're trying and they're going to want to see that you have a plan and they're going to want to see that you're taking care of yourself so that in the two years that you're making your movie you are able to actually make your movie. And what I mean by that is when you're budgeting and you're going out for, to find investors, you need to put yourself in the budget as a filmmaker because we as filmmakers are really passionate, right? We know mm -hmm. that we'll work a day job and then we'll get the movie done on the weekends and at night, right. but the regular world doesn't think that way. And so when somebody's looking at your plan and they're looking at your budget and they see that you're not in it, they think you're going to fail. And so they're not going to give you money. So you have to set yourself up for success and you have to show them a, that you're taking care of yourself and that you're seriously committed to making this movie happen and B, and that's by putting yourself in the budget and then B by showing them, look, this is, this is where we want to go. We really want Warner brothers to pick our movie up and we want to get, you know, a six figure deal from them. But if we can't, then here's how we can release it on our own. And here's our plan to do that so that we can ensure that there's a better chance of you making your money back. So uh, what you're saying is, is in your business plan, you know, when you go to the investors, mm -hmm. you actually should have a couple different plans. Like, so not just that you want to self distribute through m multiple platforms, but you should have yeah. like a, I mean, I hear people do this with budgets, which, you know, is, is debatable whether it's a good idea or not, but they've got the, They've got the three budget levels, right? The, yeah. the the highest budget. This is, you know, if we got, you know, every bell and whistle we wanted. This is if we got absolutely no money, and then one right in the middle. Right. Uh, and you know, there's there's debate whether or not that's actually a good way to approach things, and I don't want to get into that specifically. But but you should you're what I'm kind of hearing is that you should almost do that with your distribution models. Right. Yes. You should have the, the Sony picks it up. You know, and but yet if they don't, 
and right. And how well, gonna... and Sony picking it up isn't a distribution model. It's just the goal. Okay. Right. Okay. And so you think of it this way. I want a major studio to pick it up. And the way that I'm going to approach that is we're going to make a movie that has stars that they're really excited about. We're going to make a movie that has a topic that can go across the world. We're going to make a movie that, um, that just is lined up with this specific type of studio, okay. right? And that's the plan for the studio model. But you're not going to put a ton of time into that because as far as the business plan is concerned, right. that should absolutely be your goal when you're making the movie. Like you should line the movie up with that goal because if you make a movie for Sony or, or um, Paramount or Universal, right. then your movie is going to be worthy of some sort of theatrical release. Sure. And so the product should always be at that level. But then if this, if Sony or whatever studio isn't interested in it, you still have a way for your investors to recoup some of their cost, which if not all of their costs. Which cost. you've figured out well in advance. Right. 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 Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. And the cool thing, like for us, Warner Brothers picked up April Showers after we released it. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So there's a whole other way to do it uh, in thinking of the distribution. Like self-distribution can absolutely be a marketing plan for a studio to pick up. Oh, film. that's funny. That, that's so counterintuitive to what most people I know. say. Is that, you know, oh, well, if you if you release it out there, then you know, festivals are going to want to touch it. And then the studios won't want to touch it because people have already seen it and blah, blah, blah. But I right. guess that's not, not necessarily true. I mean, I think about, I think it was, um, what was the movie, not Blair Witch, but the one that was similar that just came out like 10 years ago. Oh, in the, in the house. Uh, yes, in the house. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about and I can't think of so, it. So, it's a rumor. Paranormal activity. Paranormal activity. It's a rumor that paranormal activity was bought by a studio so they could remake the ending. And the ending was re was the reason that it got a theatrical release. Ah, interesting. So, like, you just never know what's happening behind the scenes. Right. And you shouldn't, as an independent filmmaker, worry too much about that because anything is possible. Like, we're literally in the land of dreams here in, in movie making. Sure. And it's really fascinating to me. But, oh, but the thing I was going to say about film festivals is it's true if you release your movie, a film festival probably won't pick it up if okay. they're one of the major festivals. But what you can do is go to them and say, look, we've got this theatrical release lined up. We would love to premiere it at your festival. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so there is a little bit of, not even a little bit of, there's a lot of strategy that's involved in creating a distribution model that's going to be implementable by you um, as, an, as an independent filmmaker. But it's important to think this way and have these conversations and because it affects everything. If you decide your film is going to, um, you want it to go theatrical and, or you decide, Oh, I want to make a web series. That's very different equipment. It's different casting. It's different crew. It's mm -hmm. different. It's just different. Sure. And so it's important to understand what your, what your goal is and what your plan is to get there. Um, well in advance of actually raising the money. Right. Uh, so, um, well, I guess, uh, that brings me a little bit to kind of the next phase or, or this most current phase, I guess, of, of your career is, is the Jenna Edwards media and the indie movie mastery. And yeah. one thing I'm a little unclear about is, is how those two work together or separately. What, like, tell me what those two are and what the differences are. So Jenna Edwards media is my production company, essentially. Um, and Indie Movie Mastery is a project I'm doing. Okay. That's like the best way for me to put it out there. Uh, so a lot of my branding goes specifically into Jenna Edwards Media just because it makes the most sense mm -hmm. for the long term for me um, in my career because one of my big, big goals is to um, have a talk show and a travel show and, and interview people. And so with Indie Movie Mastery, I get to do that, but with specific audience of filmmakers. Okay. Um, and Indie Movie Mastery is also where my heart lies. <laughs> a okay. lot of, it's a very heart project for me sure. because I, um, I just, I see so many filmmakers struggle with 
creating a career that's sustainable for them and making projects that they love at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I've been really lucky to be somebody who's made projects I'm really proud of and um, be around people who do the same thing. And so when I meet filmmakers who are struggling to understand the producing end of things, I, I feel really drawn to educate because I, when I first started with film methods specifically, I learned this and that was my perspective on filmmaking is very different. I've, I've never wanted to be a director. I don't like editing. It's my least favorite part of the process. I'm not a writer in that way. You know what I mean? So like, I would never call myself a filmmaker, but I've had the experience of working with the most gifted filmmakers. And so I respect the beep out of that. And my perspective is always in how can I support the vision? How can I be a producer on this project without feeling like my, my creative vision isn't being met because it's not about me. And so, um, that's why Indie Movie Mastery was so important because it allows for me to educate in a producing aspect so that filmmakers can feel confident in making their visions come to, tr to life. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And then on the other side, I worked with this one filmmaker um, who really wanted to work with a friend of his. And his friend came on as a producer and his friend didn't know anything about producing and it was a nightmare because I was like having to educate while producing. And it was like, oh my gosh. And I saw this man who just really wanted to help, but didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, somebody needs to teach producing and not just producing in a film school capacity, because I feel like that's very one dimensional. It's like the way producing is taught at film schools. A lot of times isn't all encompassing. It's like, you need to get the crew and the cast and the equipment and the locations, and then you need to get it edited and that's your job. Mm -hmm. But that's the job of the line producer. Like that's not the job of a producer in the independent world. In the independent world, the producer is literally seeing the big picture of the project as a business where the filmmaker is seeing the big picture of the project as a creative story movie as a movie. For right. Sure. Okay. And so, my goal is to teach producers or teach filmmakers what producing actually is mm -hmm. and then teach people who would want to be producers with those filmmakers. Like a lot of times I, um, I'll do workshops and seminars and I'll offer a two for one so that you can bring the person that you want to produce your movies in sure. and like you guys can learn together so yeah. that you have the right. same information and and you can grow this kind of partnership that needs to exist when you're making a film and learn, learn how to talk the same language yeah. all these things yeah absolutely and so it's just indie movie mastery is where i'm gonna do that um okay. and it's it's just so exciting for me um a little backstory on why it's it became about was i got really burned out mm -hmm. Um, I really did because after the Hulu project, uh -huh. I realized that um, the the team I was working with was really excited about new, like they were all about the new and I loved that, but that's not how I am. I'm all about the heart. I'm all about the like, like how do we tell the story that means something to us and the world in a really unique way. And they were about the equipment, you know, or the okay. new distribution model or sure. like, they're definitely the ones that would listen to the, what do they call it? Equipment porn podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the tech porn. Like they just like that. And I don't begrudge them that at all, but sure. I was really unfulfilled in that world. And so I, I had always dreamed of doing like, speaking and writing and being in the self-improvement world and all of that stuff. And so I retired. I literally threw myself a retirement party. I invited all of my filmmaker friends and I said, everybody meet everybody and go make movies together. I'm out. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> and, and, um, and how many, this, how many movies had you done at that point? Like how many projects? Uh, roughly. Like 10. Okay. All right. I want to say yeah. um, in probably I think I started in 2007 and I retired 
in 2002. So it was it was a five year span where I did. I mean, 2012. Ten, no. <laughs> um, most of them were just me being hired to come in ten days before the project was going to shoot and like mm-hmm. try and figure out what's going on, which was really fun, but not how I like to roll. Um, <laughs> And so anyway, I retired and I went into the self-help world and I became a coach and I did a lot of self-improvement studying and um, just really delved into that world. And while I was in that world, I was like, God, something's missing. Like these aren't my people, you know? And then I was at this event and I all, it was with filmmakers and they started talking to me in the way that I used to talk to them on the podcast. And I was so excited and I was like, I can coach filmmakers. So I came back into the film world very specifically to educate and empower Mm -hmm. filmmakers to make the movies that they really want to make, not the movies they think they have to make in order to be to have a successful career, if that makes sense. And so that's what I'm up to. And it's been a blast. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, that's really fascinating. I mean, I, I didn't even know about your kind of dip out for a little while. And, and, uh, so, <laughs> out, <yeah. laughs> so when did you kind of reemerge? When, did, when did you, uh, I mean, February I, of this year, February. Okay. So I'm assuming yeah. that Jenna Edwards media was kind of still around for a while from your old days. And then yeah. in the movie mastery is what you kind of added the dynamic. Yep. Yeah, nice. Jenna Edwards Media was because somebody else had JennaEdwards.com. <laughs> and I was like, well, what can I, what can I do? <laughs> yeah, no, and then it was like, oh, my God, it means, it, like, the acronym is GEM, and that just made me so happy. So I was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dork, funny. you guys. It's no, okay. I, I actually uh, was on the, the GEM chat a few days ago, and uh, it, I actually – had like a the epiphany moment of what because I thought yeah well that's cool oh, oh. I get it <laughs> so I was uh, <laughs> you know this is like an hour into the little chat that you do because oh. if people don't know on Twitter you do uh, three times a week at mm-hmm. uh, what two p.m. Pacific is that right eleven a.m. Pacific 11 so two p.m. Eastern um, we do an hour of just chatting and. Q and A and inspiration and empowerment and whatever you guys want to talk about, I am down. I mean, I suggest a topic, but it doesn't ever have to stay that way. Sure. And I just want to be there. You know, I just I feel like this industry is so isolating at times, yeah. and especially for those of us in the position of producing or directing, it's like we have to be these leaders, and oftentimes we're so insecure in what we're doing because we're creatives. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's this level of fake it till you make it that can either allow you to rise to the challenge or it can beat you down. Like if you have to fake so much that like I I'm famously quoted as saying I cried myself to sleep every single night on my first production. Mm. Um, And it was because of exactly that. Like you're in this position where you're supposed to know exactly what's going on in this environment where nothing ever goes right or the same anytime. And you're having to be that, that rock and that pillar to the rest of the team in order to allow them to be as creative as they possibly can be. And it just, it becomes a lot. And so I, I decided, you know, a big part of indie movie mastery is support and, and encouragement. And like in the Facebook group, I love, the idea of getting people to celebrate their little victories. Like I didn't, I didn't feel like writing a page today in my script, but instead I sat down and I ended up writing five. Awesome. Like we need to applaud that because it's really hard at times. Yeah. No, so, I, was talking, yes. I was talking Twitter about that. With, I was talking about that with somebody the other day about how, you know, you, you have to just get to this point where, you know, you, you, what motivates you is, is the the stuff you're creating and uh yeah. until you get to that point you know but it's hard to get to that point so yeah so if people go to twitter uh search hashtag gem chat yep. uh and then i guess they go to the live option uh there's a yes. live tab they can go there and i'll I'll, put, I'll throw a link up for that too because cool. I, yeah i mean you know i've participated uh here and there on it and I, I think it's fun it's you know sometimes i'll just sit back and, and look at what people post you know, because yeah, I see a lot of people doing that. And I, I appreciate that, you know, whatever it takes to get you motivated to do the to keep doing the work. I really do think 
that we need to recognize how important what we do is, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, film, like we look at it as entertainment, but every single film or every single piece of media has the ability to change someone's life. And so it's important for people to, for filmmakers, especially to understand that they're doing what they're doing is, is needed in the world. And if you're discouraged, so are a lot of other people. So just, you know, put it out there and we'll, we'll support you. You're amazing in the Facebook group, by the way. Uh, And so I appreciate that. Um, and that's open to anybody as well. So that's indie movie mastery community on Facebook. We'd love to have you. But then even on a visceral level of, you know, movies obviously are, are important, you know, culturally, socially. But, you know, at the end of the day, they, if, if we can create this shift, like both you and I, are, I mean, I'm that's kind of my mission too, merging the art and business of independent filmmaking. You know, yeah. if we can make a living, then we're feeding Absolutely. ourselves and supporting ourselves. And, and at the end of the day, sometimes that's enough, you know, to... You're putting your you're putting your heart out there and make and being able to live. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing though, it's not even just enough. Think of all of the people that are affected by you making a living doing your art. Mm-hmm. Your family, their family, their friends, you know, it's just other it's, crew members. Other crew I mean, literally independent filmmakers are small business owners and until we start to embrace that fact, we're not going to be able to make the impact in on the world that we want to make, mm-hmm. you know? So let's talk a little bit about um, just kind of quickly, like some of the things that you're offering, you know, like what services or, or, or products do you, you know, can I get sure. through in new movie mastery? How are you helping people, you know, uh, specifically? Okay. Um, well, the first thing is I do consultations. I'm a consulting producer. And what that means for people that work with me is, Um, You get this dedicated support that I give to the rest of the world, but on a very specific level, Um, I'll help you break your project down. We'll go through like the first thing that I ever, that I do whenever a client comes to me is say, what's the goal of the movie? Like we've been talking about. And then we create a plan from the, from the end to the beginning of how you can actually make that happen. And then, um, Another thing I love to do is help people to assemble the right team because I always say like you can have the most amazing director and the most amazing DP, but if they don't speak the same language, your film's going to suck. It's just not going to work. And um, so something I'm really gifted at, and I, I say that with all humility because I do think it's a gift is to be able to go, you need to communicate with this person this way because this is how they're hearing you. And you need to work with this person because you guys will absolutely make magic. But if you want to work with this person, I don't really recommend it. But if you do, here's how I think you should approach it. Because honestly, it's so funny how we get so caught up in the idea of hurting someone's feelings. I was this way for a long time, right? I was like, I can't say no to my friends. My friends all have to work on my project. Mm -hmm. And some of my friends are just not talented in the same, like in the way that's going to fill in a gap for this director, for Mm -hmm. example, like I have this one um, crew member who has this just insanely awesome energy for me, but I have this one director who can't handle it. And so I'm not going to put them together. It just doesn't make sense. (laughs) My big thing, and this is something I would love for all filmmakers to start thinking of is asking yourself this question every time you hit a roadblock. And that is what's best for the project. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is before you start to put your project out in the world in general, um, do a little branding with it and sit down and go, okay, what's the purpose of this project? Is this project going to be put out in the world because the the message is we need to stop high school shootings, for example, Mm -hmm. April showers, right? Um, Or we need to highlight more specifically for me, it was let's highlight, um, the aftermath of survival. Right. Okay. So that's what the project's goal is. Now in, in the producing of the project, the goal would be, it's a really heavy, heavy subject matter. So we need to figure out how we can balance everybody's mood and make sure they're having fun, but not being, you know, inappropriate because frankly, people were watching us. Like the community would not have enjoyed it if they saw us laughing our butts off 
during the high school shooting scene. You know, like you just have to be appropriate. Right. So as we're we're going through this whole producing process, those two things are really at top of mind as a producer, right? And so as we're crewing up, we're thinking, who is going to be able to appropriately keep the energy up without being inappropriately giddy <laughs> about making a movie? Sure. And then at the same time, we're thinking, okay, well, every content decision or every casting decision needs to serve the, the idea of the film showing the aftermath of Survivors. So if, if there's an actor out there who's known for throwing temper tantrums and not showing and showing up to interviews drunk, like we're not going to hire them, you know, because that's not what's best for the project. And so this idea of what's best for the project is how I recommend everybody go forward with producing their film. Mm -hmm. And when you come to me for a consultation, if you don't know that already, like what what would be best for the project, we'll work through that. Right. And we'll do a lot of branding. And then that branding will pour it over into the marketing plan. Um, so basically, I just love helping filmmakers create the production plan for the entire project. Um, and then I definitely have lots of resources. So if there's anybody missing from the crew that they need, I can refer. Sure. Um, you know, I have the ability to talk to different distribution outlets and be like, okay, I think this would be right for you. Um, I think basically if you work with me on a consulting basis, we're going to do, we're never ever going to do the, oh, we'll just take it model. Like it's always about abundance and never lack, if that makes sense. That's where my like self-improvement coaching comes in. Sure. This whole idea of, of, um, well, I just need an agent, for example, mm. right? Oh, we just need a distribution rep. Well, no, you need the right dis right distribution rep right. for your project. You right. know, if you have a if you have April Showers going to a company that distributes horror films, is not going to be the right <laughs> distribution right. Sure. company. Yeah. You know, and so like things like that. Like I think as filmmakers, we get very very panicked because we yeah. feel like we're not in control of of the business part of it. And so I like to bring the control back around, if well, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. But it sounds like, I mean, what you're kind of illuminating a little bit is, is the interconnectedness of everything. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that a lot of people aren't realizing how those things are connected? Maybe. Yeah. I guess I would love for you to elaborate a little more on that. Well, you were saying how, you know, uh, you, you need to go maybe with this actor over this actor because of, you know, just the subject matter of the film. Whereas I think a lot of people are like, okay, well, the film is one thing, the casting is another thing, yeah. the distribution is another thing, but there's really a lot of interplay that should be considered, you know? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, it's just like a small business, right? You're going to, you're going to figure out who your target audience is and build your, coffee shop on the corner where that audience exists. Um, and I think oftentimes in film, we think of our audience as the people who are going to watch the movie, but there's a ton of different audiences before you even get to the main audience. Hmm. Like you have to look at your cast as an audience. You have to look at your crew as an audience. You have to look at your funders as an audience. Like what is it about the film that's going to sell them on investing, being in it, making it, distributing it, all of those things. Like until we get to the main audience, there's just so many things that are connected. Hmm. I had never heard that, uh, kind of, uh, angle on it. I mean that, you know, that our audience isn't just the people watch, kind of that are the end, end watchers. That's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, oh, cool. I'm glad. <laughs> it's something <laughs> yeah, to think about. I'm writing a book on that exact thing right now. Um, I think I'm thinking about entitling it Perspective Shift hmm. because it's it really is this ability to see what you're talking about right there from the other person's perspective, sure. you know? Um, and d does that come into play for like crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and all that too? everything okay. right how many people are asking you to invest in their films <laughs> all the time yeah I mean, right. 
probably the most emails I get or, or private messages or, or check out my film and can, can you donate and or can you share it to fund you it? you want to have funded. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I only say that and I'm a little sarcastic about it because it is exactly that perspective shift that needs to happen. When filmmakers are funding or crowdfunding their movies, they need to be going out to their main audience. Not filmmakers. Right. I mean, unless the filmmaker is their audience, like I would love to, you know, I love supporting films that are empowering because that's my brand. But if mm -hmm. you're going to come to me about a torture porn movie, I'm going to be like, no, like, sure. I'm not gonna, I want to support you as a filmmaker, of course, but right. that's not something personally that I'm going to put my money into. But you're right. We and, feel like a, a lot of filmmakers are, are expected to support the other filmmakers. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I just feel like, and I do, I, I try to as much as I possibly can. But again, the thing with crowdfunding that I think is the perspective shift is that crowdfunding is much more about building an audience for when your film is done than it is about getting funding for your film. Right. You know, and I honestly think, I wish more filmmakers would use crowdfunding as a development fund, mm -hmm. funding source. So that it's part of their funding plan, but not their entire funding plan, so that they can make a bigger budgeted movie. Interesting. So, re literally, crowdfund your development phase, but not your production phase. Right. Or, or maybe, maybe, but as separately. Of course. Right. Cool. Because I'm on a personal mission to get filmmakers to start paying themselves. Um, <laughs> and I just don't, the money from crowdfunding doesn't allow for that. Right. No, it doesn't. You know? I mean, you, it, it's almost like if you budget yourself into a crowdfunding project, it, it, it seems kind of like, uh, I don't know what the word is, but, but it's definitely viewed negatively by, exactly. you know, especially people outside the film industry, you know, what, yes. what do you mean? What do you mean? There's, you know, 5,000 of this money going to movie. the director. Well, the director's not going to work for a month because he or she will be making this movie for, and they, you know, right. they need to pay their rent and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah. I find that interesting. Um, I lost my train of thought there. I, it's okay. You, you blew I my mind a little bit. I story about that, that <laughs> like made the whole like passion for, um, filmmakers paying themselves so prevalent in my mind. And it was, I went to this networking event a couple of months ago and I walked in and, and they had us put name tags on. And so I put, um, production consultant on mine okay. and this producer came up and immediately was like, Oh my God, can you help me, um, get paid to make movies? I'm so sick of not getting paid. And I had this moment of like, cause it was just the way she pr presented herself. Sure. I was like, well, you're kind of a negative Nilly. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was just not in the right mind space or sure. something because she just rubbed me the wrong way the way she said it. Mm -hmm. But it was this moment of like, you realize that you're the producer, which means you're the one that makes the budget, which means you're the one that raises the money. So if you're not willing to raise it to a level of professionalism, then maybe you just need to rethink, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. But like my whole thing with, with that is if you want to make movies and not make a living at it, then, then just admit that it's a hobby to yourself and that's fine. Sure. But if you want to make movies and make a living at it, then you just need to create a plan like any other business and make movies your career. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's a perspective shift that I think a lot of filmmakers need to have in order to make a living making movies. <laughs> Well, Why not? Well, I would say, you know, in my experience, because I've only crowdfunded one project and it did not do, it did not go well. But uh, I actually wrote like a, a blog post about it. And, you know, I, I got the movie made anyways. And, and you know, that's, you know, it's a fun story. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And, and, you know, but it was a lesson, obviously. Like the whole crowdfunding thing was a lesson, I, the things I took away from it. But the one thing, you know, about this specifically is that I felt like, I couldn't include myself in the budget because I felt like, okay, I have to prove to this audience, whoever, you know, this, this faceless audience that I am a passionate filmmaker and that I can create those films. 
so I, I guess I want to segue a little bit into interesting uh, into you know that specifically like what do you feel like uh, an up and coming you know director or writer director or, or even a producer what kind of body work should they be building to to prove themselves or, or do they need to or you know uh, pass I mean pass the student level okay sure um and I don't mean to insult filmmakers. I just mean to empower filmmakers sure. by saying it doesn't have to be that way. Like people make money making movies every day. Right. It's just a matter of figuring out for you how that can happen and then going to work. And it's a lot of work, right? So I would say, again, with the, the begin with the end in mind model for you here, let's do a coaching right now. Okay. What is your goal? <laughs> Uh, my goal is to... As a filmmaker, like, if a, you had your dream career, what would it look like? Uh, I'd be directing movies, and uh, I'd be directing movies that I write, and producing okay. movies that other people will write and direct. Okay. So you do enjoy producing. I, I love, yeah, I mean, I love okay. the idea of, like, helping somebody else achieve their dream. So. Oh my god, I love it. <laughs> okay. So, let's focus specifically on your directing wait okay. which one do you want to do more directing for sure that's okay. uh, that's been with me since i was you know a little boy so okay good so i would invite you to be more specific mm -hmm. um and feel free to write this stuff down <laughs> <laughs> um i have it recorded so <laughs> perfect when you say you would want to write and direct projects that you made what do those projects look like do you have a specific genre you want to work in? Uh, I probably couldn't say right this second, but yeah, I mean, uh, more dramatic kind of okay. stuff, uh, and, and sci-fi really interests me too. So dramatic science fiction type stuff. Awesome. Is there somebody who already exists who does films like the ones you want to do? Not that I would point to right, right this second though. I mean, not like a Spielberg or a J.J. Abrams or a um, uh, George I, Lucas. I would say probably J.J. Uh, Abrams is probably the most modern person. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They don't I, have to be modern, by the no, way. No, I know, but uh, yeah. The reason I ask that is because oftentimes as filmmakers, we want to be like, I'm so much more creative or I'm different, right? Which is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I would always say um when I first got out here I'm like I'm creative in a constructive environment if you give me the world I am like uh, uh. <laughs> but if you give me a box and a set of paints I'm like yes okay I know what to do right <laughs> so in our minds it's like what's the box that you can create just right now and that box can change but for the purposes of achieving a goal or creating a path it's important to have something that you can visualize at the end. Okay. So let's say you want to um, create a career like J.J. Abrams. Okay. Right? And what does that mean? Like, what parts of his career do you love? You love the types of movies he does. Mm -hmm. Do you want to work at a studio or do you want to do independent? I think I'd rather do independent. So you probably want a career like J.J. Abrams and George Lucas. Yeah, I guess probably, yeah, more like George Lucas. Yeah, sure. Right. So, and, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, go through this really quick, but the essential idea is the more specific you can get, mm -hmm. the easier it's going to be for you to see a path. So if you um, say, I want to do J.J. Abrams style or type content and be really specific, like I like his camera movement, I like his casting, I like whatever it is. Sure. With George Lucas's style of production company, where and then be specific there, where he works with studios but not within studios. He's mm -hmm. able to delve into new technology. He's whatever it is about that model mm -hmm. it, that you like. And then the reason is because now you can make decisions based on what project you're going to do next much more clearly. Like the next project that you do should absolutely be in line with your ultimate goal. So you're not going to do a romantic comedy. Right. You know, right. Um, it's this idea of, is it an opportunity or a distraction? Mm -hmm. 
And unless you know what your ultimate goal is, you can't tell the difference. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. So it's, it's so fun. Yeah. <laughs> like Once you get on that path, you're like, oh, this is so cool because now I know what project I'm going to go work on. And then you get to work on it. And then, so in the building of your resume, it's more of, you know, I want to do a short film because I want to test out this camera, for example. Well, okay, then I'm going to do a short film that's based on the genre I want to work in. Um, or that deals with the camera angle movement or movement, whatever it is that you are really into creating as your signature style. That's another thing for directors is even if you direct different types of genres, like, like a Spielberg film, for example, you know, it's a Spielberg film, right? Because it has a certain feel to it. Mm -hmm. And so for you as an independent filmmaker, what does that feel? What is it that's going to make people go, that is a John Fallon movie? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Uh, Like a Woody Allen movie. You know exactly what it's going to be. Even though he touches on different subject matters, you know? Sure. Um, So when you're just starting out, I think it's just important to find what it is that you want to leave on the planet, like what mark you want to leave and then start to do it smaller and then bigger and then bigger and then bigger and then bigger. Um, And I would also recommend if you're not in film school Mm -hmm. and you want to be a professional filmmaker, unless you want to make giant blockbuster movies, um, don't make shorts. Really? I just think... I mean, this is just my opinion, you know, the reason is because like, if you want to make big blockbuster movies, all you can afford to do is a short version of that. Sure. Right. But if you want to make, um, you know, character driven pieces, then why wouldn't you make a a feature that you're going to be able to sell for the same price that it would cost you potentially to make a short film? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes the price difference on certain types of movies isn't that big. Like it's not a big difference. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense because then you have more of a product to sell. So exactly. Yeah. That will fund your next project. And then, you know, sure. like if you start in the micro budget world and you make a micro budget feature for 50,000, there's nothing that says you can't make a hundred thousand on it and then fund your next film. Right. But that's all within the planning phase of your career path. Right. Well, so what do you feel about people who are, their career path, I guess, is being driven through making a name for themselves at festivals? Okay. With their shorts. What's the end goal, though? I don't know. The, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess That would be, the, I mean, that would honestly be my only question. I feel like I know a lot of filmmakers who have made short films as a calling card. Okay. But, um... Do they ever get called? <laughs> yeah, some of them, absolutely. And you know what? It honestly works really well if you want to direct television. Okay. Because then you have something to show. Then you have different genres that you can show TV producers and writers that that prove you can do that type of content. But if you want to make feature films... Mm-hmm. Let me rephrase. It also works for people who want to get hired at studios. Okay. Sure. But again, studios are making big budget movies, so right. you can really only afford to do a smaller right. version of their types of movies. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it seems like a lot of people do like the proof of concept short, which then yes. using that to, but that's really more of a marketing. That's different. That's more of yes. marketing, right? Yeah, that to me is, is, very different from doing short films as calling cards. Mm. Um, that has a very specific purpose. And I think it's actually a really smart way to get a feature film funded um, through the through the festival network. I think it's brilliant. But if you're making a, a, sh- a short film just as a short standalone film, that doesn't that doesn't lead into a feature. I mean, I would, I would have to ask you what your ultimate goal would be. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I want to touch on 
a couple more things before we uh, before we uh, call off here. So, okay. um, so let's just take that kind of uh, the you know hypothetical person who's uh, you know they've made their calling card shorts or whatever. You know, let's just say they went down that path. Uh, now they want to make uh, a feature. Okay. And so, but they're they're a writer director. They're not a producer. So, okay. So when do they bring that producer on board? When? How do they arrange that relationship, and uh, and how do they build it where it becomes a business model? Okay. Um. Oh, really quick though, the okay. other thing that short films are good for is creating your team. Oh sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think. That also is why it's important for you to know as a filmmaker what your ultimate goal is, because if you want to make empowering movies, for example, and you come to me with a short film and you show me your plan, then I'm going to be more likely to invest my time as a producer into your short film and working with you as a director to develop that relationship on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm than I would if you just came to me with a short film and you were like, well, you're a producer, come work for free. You know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing uh, in the future, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very smart way to develop this producing team that we're about to talk about. I think it's crucial for you as an independent filmmaker to understand a few things before you approach a producer. One is what your goal is with that project. Okay. Um, what your goal as a filmmaker in general is, mm -hmm. what your style is in personality, not just in filmmaking. Um, are you a good networker? Are you, a, are you well connected? Are you, um, all about the arts and the business stuff is just completely lost on you. All of these things are really important to understand about yourself. Um, so that you can go to a producer who compliments you. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I see filmmakers so desperate to find a producer. It's just like the agent scenario. So sure. desperate to find a producer that they get the wrong one on the project and the project falls apart. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of self-work almost that has to go into becoming a successful filmmaker who can bring on a producer to their project. Like I think the reason April Showers was able to overcome so many of the hurdles that it had was because Andrew really, Andrew was the writer director. He really knew who he was and was able to communicate that to me. Like we were able to develop a really great working relationship where I knew what he was thinking before he did. Hmm. And I could anticipate it. And as a producer, that's something you want to be able to give to a filmmaker, right? You said it. You want to be able to help them make their dreams happen. Right. It's probably the number one motivation of any producer I've ever talked to. And if you aren't able to help us do that, then we're going to feel like we're not doing our job. Um, and so, so that's important. And then you want to look at your scripts. Okay. So there's different phases. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who just, who's a director who just has an idea, and I say just has an idea, like I'm not belittling it, like having an idea is huge, mm -hmm. who has an idea but is not a writer. So you need to get a writer on board. Um, you will want to bring a producer in before you get a writer on board. And oftentimes I tell people, you know, call me or, or it doesn't have to be me, but a consultant. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to get locked into working with a producer that you don't know that early on. Okay. Right? So there's, a, there's definitely a way to make sure that you're setting your project up for success without setting yourself up for um, being tied to someone that might not work. Okay. Does that make sense? Because sure. as you're in the writing process, the script is going, the idea is going to come to life and the producer may be like, mm, lukewarm about it once it's done, but you're locked in. That's someplace I don't want any director to be. Um, so once you've got your script and you're set on the way you're going to direct it, that's when I would call a producer in with the caveat of you have to be flexible and willing to hear their ideas because they're going to look at the project in a very different way 
hopefully they're going to look at it big picture like we've been talking about and go, okay, so I love that this, um, what's a great example? Oh, I love that you want to do a story about a shooting, but if we want to get a really great name attached, um, maybe we should make it a high school shooting so that we can cast a lot of younger actors and then talk to their agents about bringing in a celebrity for a couple of days to up the profile. Mm -hmm. That'll make it make more sense in our budget. And then we'll be able to do some marketing around it. And um, you see, you get the point, right? So there's like a whole different world of strategy going on with that, with that script in that phase than a director might even realize. Right. And so bring the producer in once the script is, is at a place where you know that you can direct it and you're comfortable with it, but not at a place where you're locked into it. And you're like, I'm not budging. Gotcha. There's like a very delicate balance. And that would be one producer and they would be the lead producer and they would need to be very entrepreneurial. Um, You know, oftentimes filmmakers are like, I'm going to bring in a producer to raise money. Here's the deal guys. No producer is going to raise money on their own. You have to be willing to help. And it has to be a team project. And that is why, quite frankly, it needs to be a project you're passionate about and that is personally connected to you in some way. You know, April Showers was obviously connected to Andrew, but it was connected to me because of my experience in the farmer's market crash, which I know you're going to put links to. um, So we won't get too much into it, but... My, there was a character in that movie that was absolutely my experience with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so I had that personal connection. So when I talked to investors, it was a lot of, here's how we're going to, you know, run this business, Mm -hmm. but here's why we're the right people to do it. Right. Okay. So think of the first producer that comes in as a producing partner for you. Like you guys are really married in this process. Mm -hmm. And then what you're going to want to do, if you're, if that producer isn't good at budgets, here's the thing with budgets. Um, I do a 21 day budget challenge Mm -hmm. and it's preliminary and people always get like so caught up in the details of the budget. That's not your job at the beginning. At the beginning, it's, can we make this movie and make it successful for this amount of money? And then once you decide yes, Absolutely. Um, You go out and you raise that amount of money and then you bring in a line producer and there are different processes with this, but this is a way you can do it with not a lot of money up front. So then you bring in a line producer and you say, um, here's our budget. Our budget is half a million. Make it work. Mm -hmm. You know, and the line producer is then going to go through and make that budget work for you because here's the deal with indie producing. How many favors are you going to call? You're going to call a lot of favors, right? I have very different favors and people to call on than you do. So if you brought me in to do the budget um, and you wanted me to do it so specifically, it wouldn't make sense because I'm going to cut costs in certain areas that you're not going to be able to deliver on. Right. Okay. So in the indie world, it's different from the the studio world or even the um, upper level independent world where you're working with the studio or a distribution company in advance um, because they're not calling in favors. Right. Right. You're they're paying for stuff. Paying premium. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Once you get to that level, yeah, you should hire a line producer right away um, and they'll do your preliminary budget and then you'll most likely be tied to them and it's fine. Um, so, so you bring in your, um, your producer, your producing partner, Then you get a budget made, then you put together a business plan, and then you most likely will go out and raise the money, and you can do that in two ways, or multiple ways, really, but for the purposes of when to bring in producers, you can either raise the money on your own as a team, or you can find executive producers who will raise it with you. Mm. They're never going to raise it for you. Sure. I I mean, I hate to break it to you, but it's like the biggest myth in the world that somebody is going to raise money for your project. Like it just, you have to be involved Mm -hmm. because you're the director. So you're the face. 
get real comfortable with that. And is it um, a true partnership, <laughs> like you're saying? Like, so they're coming in. There's no money yet, and they're they're doing it with you. Basically, they're investing in their future as well to raise right. this money. Right. Okay. Because yeah, they they'll own part of the project, and they'll um, their investment is time. Okay. If they're an executive producer for real, um, oftentimes investors get executive producer credits mm -hmm. because they're bringing in money. So the way to look at executive producer credits in the indie capacity, well, most capacities, but is money, right? Sure. But most of the time, independent filmmakers um, think of money as money, like physical, they're going to invest in the movie. But sure. the reality is, it might be someone who brings in a cast member who's going to bring in some money. Right. It might be somebody who the distribution company almost always gets executive producer credit because they're selling the movie. Mm -hmm. um, it might be like you wouldn't be able to get a location without this person, so they're going to get it. Anything that you would have to put money out, if you get it for free, sometimes the executive producer credit goes to those people. Sure. But that's more um, of a... It's a kind of a title it's not necessarily a position in the same way like the same way of i mean i, I yeah. get what you're saying but yeah it's it's almost like a reward for for having an asset kind of i mean they have to they have to do work in the negotiation sure of making sure that that asset actually comes to the table right um so that's their job like the executive producer is really about funding the project okay. in whatever capacity <laughs> right. it is. The thing that um, filmmakers have to remember is don't be given out credits willy nilly because certain executive producers won't come in if there's like over X amount of credits in the executive producer world. Mm. Actually that's across all platforms. So I had a film once um, and one of the crew members came in at half rate for a producer credit, but they were like, you can't give this producer credit to anybody else. Hmm. And so we, as a project had to like, as a team had to sit down and decide whether or not that was best for the project. Sure. But those are types of negotiations that happen often, um, especially in the indie world. Um, so once you have all of that, then the producer credit, like you can bring on as many producers as you want. I would hesitate in giving, producer producer credit um unless they're actually producing okay and if you go to producersguild.org they lay out the different credits for you oh okay um there's also what was i going to say oh co-production is typically given to another company that's coming in <clears throat> so let's say that you've got a project and, and you and I decide as production companies to team up, that would be a co-production. Sure. Okay. So you would get a co-producer credit and I would get a co-producer credit. Right. That kind of thing. Um, so the credits are definitely thrown around in different ways. However, the main producer credit is reserved and it's usually the produced by credit. Um, and it's reserved for that producing partner that you've got going on. And that's, that's really the, once you get a, a producer on board, that's an actual producer, which is why I like to train producers. Sure. <laughs> um, once you get that credit on or that person on, they'll be able to negotiate all the other stuff for you. You won't have to worry too much. Right. Wow. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. No, it's. Uh, but I, I think what's great about it is that you, you know, you're illustrating, really, like the depth the, mm. that that people really, you know, the steps they need to take, but but the depth to which they need to go to make sure that their project comes to fruition. I mean, yeah, you know, and, it's, and the thing you it's keep a hammering long process. on. <laughs> the thing you keep hammering on too is that like and and. You know, this is something I, I certainly know myself, but you, you all you you have got to put in a lot of time. Yeah. You know, it, it's just not going to just happen. Nobody is going to care about your project more than you are. Yeah. And so, uh, oftentimes, I see this, and it breaks my heart. Um, directors will work so hard to get a producer or an executive producer on, and then they'll just like sit back and relax, and the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. And they blame the producer 
But the reality is there's no one to blame but the filmmaker because it's just important to remember nobody's going to care as much as you do. And if you can find a partner who cares almost as much as you do, man, you've hit gold. <laughs> like you literally have. Um, and so I just, it's also, again, why I always go back to what's the ultimate goal and what's the ultimate goal for you as a filmmaker and how is this film going to feed your soul mm -hmm. through a good two year chunk of time while you're, you know, making it come to reality because a, you're going to have to sell that part of yourself to a producing partner mm -hmm. so that they understand the level of commitment you have. Cause on the, on the flip side, I've met so many directors who sit back and wait for me to do everything. And I'm like, I can't, like, I don't have your vision. Mm. I can't sell your vision as a producer if you're not there. Right. Right. You know? And so it just really is a two way street with the producer and the director. And what do you do? Like when you have somebody that you're producing for and, uh, how do you motivate them? Like if, if they're, if they're not pulling their end of the bargain, I mean, like, is there a conversation that happens oh, or, yeah. or, yeah. So I'm very good at calling people on their stuff nowadays. Sure. Um, when I first started out, I, I'm from Minnesota and I have like an insane work ethic. Okay. And so if people were dropping the ball, I'd just pick it up. And I had like 20 balls okay. and like trying to carry them all by myself. And right. it got to the point where I was like, this isn't, this is not what's best for the project. Things were right. getting dropped. Sure. And so I really had to work on my, on myself to be able to call people and be like, look, this isn't, this isn't how this is going to work. It just isn't. And I think the reason I had such a hard time with it at the beginning was I was afraid of losing something. Mm -hmm. You know, like we oftentimes put so much time and effort into these projects and then we're so afraid that they're going to go away yeah. that we're, we're, we're too afraid to actually create the environment that needs to be created for the project to be successful. Sure. And so now I think the filmmakers that I work with know I only have the project and their best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing too, like producers don't ego trip. Like it's so not worth it. You know, so many of them are like, I just like to say no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's important to be the support for the filmmaker and to be the support for the vision and, and filmmakers that work with me know that that's where my heart is. And so the conversations about, about not stepping up are a lot easier because they're not, it's not me attacking anybody. It's just, this isn't working. How do we make it work? You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, sometimes people have to be reminded that, uh, that Hey, you know, <laughs> you yeah. want this as much as I do. But, and well, the way exactly. to make that happen is, is, is X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Well, and same on the flip side. I mean, there were so many conversations with filmmakers where they're like, why are you not as excited to me? Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, oh, you're right. I'm not. Why? And then mm -hmm. we would literally just have like conversations about why, because it's not easy making a movie and it should be fun. But when you've got like rejection after rejection after rejection, mm -hmm. you know, it wears on you. Everybody's human. And so I think that's why I use the word partnership and and emphasize how crucial it is because you really are each other's support in this like really long marathon, <laughs> with, like, which is more like a boot camp, like training course, I think. So, so maybe, uh, how do you deal with, uh, when it's all over? Oh, right? God. And then project's oh, you're going to go into a serious depression, everybody. <laughs> Just be prepared. <laughs> it's, I mean, really, no, is, is it kind of, is there kind of a, a, oh, a meltdown yeah. period where you, where you have to kind of recuperate and, uh, totally. refresh yourself? I can't remember what people, pre-production, um, postpartum, it's like postpartum. Yeah. It really is. It's like, well, because you're running and you're running and you're running and you're running and then you're like, it's done. And the next day you're just going, I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> so I have, um, I actually read a story one time, Drew Barrymore, when she started producing, uh, she rents a hotel room for like two days, um, afterwards and doesn't tell anybody where she is uh -huh. and she just sleeps. Hmm. And then, um, I have another friend who always plans a trip. Okay. Um, for me, I like to have my next project in order. I think that's why I've created a company that's just ongoing. Sure. 
Um, but you really do have to understand that it's going to be, it's going to be a little shocking right. to your system. But that's part of your and, process, right? You, you like to have your, I mean, you seem to be somebody who has likes to have things organized and, and, and yes. you're kind of ready to go. And so, yeah, I mean, so it, it basically depends on your style. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which goes back to, it's really, as a filmmaker, it's crucial to know who you are. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, so that you can keep yourself going. What about you? Do you have a process? Uh, do I have a process? You know what? I just, I just go hang out with my kids. <laughs> so there you go. They'll they'll keep you busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> they make me laugh. So you know Aww. that that's always good. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. that's really good. Yeah. yeah. So I'm never at a loss for things to do or or people to run after or to clean up after. <laughs> so, at least not yet. I mean, they're all under five. So <laughs> oh my god, I have three three kids under five, uh, a three month old, a three year old, and a five year old. So. Oh my goodness, that's <laughs> so, so cute! So. Yeah, so you you're not going to experience postpartum, but for no, those of us who are just like <laughs> yeah. like so used to being workaholics when you're when you're done working, it's like what the heck do I do now? Right. <laughs> Which is also important. Why it's important, especially if you're not mm -hmm. living near family, to mm -hmm. budget for yourself in the budget so you can siphon off some to go visit. You sure. know, like get out of like for me, I have to get out of L.A. when I'm done producing because mm. it's just it's it's a reminder of what was going on mm -hmm. and how busy I was. And all of a sudden I'm not doing that. And it, it becomes really funky in my head. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so let's, I'd like to wrap stuff up. But is there any last things you want to say to uh, uh, listeners out there? Is there um, I would say. I'm really, really happy to be back in this community and I love filmmakers and my biggest piece of advice is to do the projects that you really, really want to do um, and know that they can seriously make a difference in people's lives and a lot of my stories about that are going to be in those links for the other podcasts but I mean, you just never know what what impact you're going to have with your project. So do the ones that you are, you feel in your heart are important. So don't be the, uh, the filmmaker who gets falls into the trap that you've got to make a horror movie to break yeah. in or all those kinds of, make the movies that you want to make. <laughs> yeah. I do that all the time. And I thought I talked about it on this one, but it was the, I had a conversation an hour ago that uh -huh. was similar and, my, the thing that breaks my heart the most is when I'm like, Hey, Oh, you're a filmmaker. Cool. What kind of mo movies do you want to make? Cause I'm always like all about the goal. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh, I really want to make romantic comedy. Oh, cool. What are you doing right now? Oh, a horror film. I'm like, <laughs> why? And they're like, because somebody told me I had to, if I wanted to make money making movies. And I'm like, maybe, maybe their like, lead can fall in love <laughs> with the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> right that movie's been done um and it was really good oh that's <laughs> right but, but here's the thing guys we do have control more than ever over the distribution mm -hmm. so why make a movie you don't love you're even if it gets picked up by a studio you're going to be somewhat if not mostly responsible for the marketing mm -hmm. so you better be marketing a movie you love Otherwise, it's gonna your life is gonna be miserable, and you're gonna stop making movies, and that will suck. <laughs> That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you want to raise any kind of money, you're gonna have to be passionate about what you're doing. Sure. And the third thing, and this is something I don't think people really understand, and I forget because LA specifically is set up for this industry, and this industry is all about networking, and so. Like there are networking parties, multiple networking parties every single night in this town, right? Just set up so you meet other filmmakers or producers or direct, like whatever. Mm -hmm. And the key to remember is those who make and distribute and fund horror movies are very different from those who make and distribute and fund dramas and comedies and television and web series. And so whatever genre you want your ultimate path to be on, 
that's where you need to start because that's who you're going to be networking with. Right. You know, if yeah. you go to a, if you go the film festival route, which is great for networking, it's going to make no sense if you're going there hoping to find someone to fall in love with you to make a romantic comedy and you've got a horror movie premiering. Right. You could just So remember that, like it's all about the ultimate goal and the path to get there. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that's great. I mean, it looks like I have a lot of uh, kind of writing for myself to do of uh, putting down those goals and oh, good. Uh, you know, I, no, definitely. I think I think that's probably one of my my weaknesses is that I I'm not ever clear enough about what where I want to be. I mean, I know the projects I want to do, but I don't necessarily know how they align and all those kinds of fun things. And so you know, I mean, uh, some self reflection is is a good thing. If, Oh, I'm so excited, and you and I have a one-on-one, so let's talk about that. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) I think that would be great. So I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I mean, you know, again, my my mission here is is to merge the the art and business of filmmaking for the independent filmmaker, and and I think that you've given us so much information about, like, ways that we can do that, you know, just, just, just tactics and, 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 and insight into how things really work. You know, so yeah. I, so I hope this will really help a lot of people. But if they want to find you, uh, how do they find you? Um, I am all over the place. <laughs> I am at Jenna Edwards on Twitter. I am Jenna Edwards Media on Facebook and Instagram. Jenna Edwards Media dot com is my website, and Indie Movie Mastery is the filmmaking arm of Jenna Edwards Media. So great, I'm sure. I love uh, that. Well, if they can't uh, remember any of that, I'll I'll put those also in the show notes, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure it'll be easy enough. <laughs> thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for letting me come on and talk to everybody. Absolutely. What a great conversation! I don't know about you, but I'm planning on listening to it a few more times to really get the most out of the information that she gave us today. As she mentioned in the interview, make sure you hop on Twitter Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Search for hashtag GemChat. Click on the live tab and join in on the conversation that she facilitates for filmmakers. It's a great forum for you to get direct contact with a working producer who is willing to peel back the curtain and help disseminate some much needed information. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode. So if you've got a comment, critique, or just want to reach out, please leave a comment on the show page or you can email us through the contact page at IndieFilmNYC.com forward slash contact. And as always, If you can rate us and leave us a review on iTunes, it really helps raise our profile so other people can find us so they can benefit from all the information we're bringing to the indie filmmakers out there. We'll see you next time, and thanks for listening to John Fallon's Indie Film NYC podcast.